They're changing IT and higher education, which isn't necessarily the same thing. I mean, on the one hand, you have, from the IT point of view, the support angle has just become many, many orders of magnitude more difficult. Um, it used to be that we could assume a simple universe of, say, Windows and PC uh, plus Mac, and that was it. And that was pretty, pretty stable with a certain family of laptops, a certain family of desktops. With mobile devices, now we get, on the one hand, many, many instances of hardware, categories of hardware, families of hardware that add on top of, but aren't fully replacing laptops and desktops. So we have smartphones, we have feature phones, we have tablets of different kinds. We have, of course, the clicker. We have mobile game players. Uh, we have DVD players. Uh, we have old school tablets. Um, we also have weird devices that we don't have categorical names for, like the touch. We have uh, MP3 players. And all of these, so the, the number, the, the type, the number of categories has just expanded and leading to net increase in demands and complexity for IT. Um, on top of that, some of these have interesting family ecosystem issues. So we've got the, in the e-reader world, we have the physical Kindle. We have other devices that can play e-reader software and e-book content but they tend to have vertical integration in different ways. So we'll get the EPUB from some places that can play in most places, but not in the Kindle. And the Kindle will have the Kindle proprietary format files, and they're very successful, but only there. Um, same thing with other file formats as we go. We're, we're seeing the rise of walled garden after walled garden, which throws us back to all kinds of classic IT dilemmas. Mobile technology has utterly transformed our space. There, there's a debate. Do you have a library as space or a space as library? Well, our end goal is that everything, every part of space on a campus can have access to the world of information available through the internet. That transforms social practices in numerous ways. It transforms the way we physically design architecture. It transforms the way that we use rooms and spaces. Um, it transforms the way we think about information. Um, it, it makes it even less scarce, reducing the illusion of scarcity for information. Um, it also increases the amount of information we produce because there are so many capture and editing devices so that we're making more stuff. I mean, we're, we're bathing in a, in a metaphorical augmented reality bleeding into a literal augmented reality. Um, having information on demand is one of the most potent forces that we have. As a result, our mechanisms of cooperation are changing, the way that we socialize are changing. It's, it's, a, it's a revolution, uh, and we can say that without any hyperbole. I think one of the most important documents of the past year was um, uh, an article written by Sir Tim Berners-Lee in Scientific American. And his argument was that so much of web interoperability is based on open standards, the fact that we can pretty much look at any web page through any web browser, and we're used to that. But native applications are forking the web in many, many ways. So we have an iPhone app. Well, only people with iPhones or iOS can actually see that or use that part of the web. That's now carved out. Um, it's yeah, Someone has a BlackBerry application, same thing. Someone has an iOS or a, 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 an Android application, same thing. It's like back in the 90s when we had this web page only viewable on Netscape, not Internet Explorer. It's forking the web into different uh, segments. Um, I think this is a very, Personally, I think this is a very dangerous thing. Uh, I think it reduces access instead of expanding it. Um, it also uh, places a lot of power in new hands. So, for example, the, the iPhone App Store has notoriously had cases of publishing or refusing certain items of content as acts as a censor. Many App Store models have that that control level. Uh, Amazon was able to do this by withdrawing a book they had sold. So we, we are re-intermediating a lot of these relationships. And at the same time, in the HTML world, we have HTML5 beginning to grow, but it's still in early days. Most of the web isn't it. We don't have a lot of good authoring tools for it, so we need to catch on to that. A lot of campuses, I think, are, are seduced by the sexiness of having an application just for a phone. It's very, very difficult uh, at a kind of global policy level to support that. The, the other problem is a more practical one. If you want to make an application for a campus, you want to do a, a class application or a campus map app, so you have Campus X and you make an iPhone app. 
well, some people aren't using iPhones. Okay, they're using Android. You make an Android app. Now you have two development paths, two development team projects. Well, it turns out somebody else doesn't have smartphones. All they have are feature phones. So you either abandon them um, or you make them some kind of text stripped down version. And again and again, you have to keep developing repeatedly. Whereas for the web, you have web content. Um, there are a whole series of problems with this. And I, I, I think um, in a recession, uh, unless we want to consider this the C++ programmer's employment uh, movement, we have to figure out a way of uh, sticking to the web. Well, I think it has been an issue. I mean, it was, uh, it was an issue in the 1990s with the early web, and once social media took off, it became a, a major issue. I mean, on the one hand, all you have to say is the word FERPA, and that's a, a kind of FUD bomb that can explode and stop any effort to do anything off campus. Um, on the other hand, there, there are very, uh, and there are practical reasons for that at times, not just FUD. Um, there's also the issue of basic uh, corporate politics. So if I outsource my photo hosting to this company and they go away, as a consumer it's one thing, but for a campus it's another thing. Uh, and even binding some of people by legal agreements doesn't necessarily help. Uh, for example, the most recent debacle over uh, Yahoo with Delicious, uh, where they inf didn't announce, but it was leaked that they were going to sunset Delicious. And many campuses who were relying on this brilliant, powerful, elegant service. And uh, suddenly it was unclear what was going to happen. So on the one hand, there was the possibility that we could lose content that was hosted there. Uh, on the other hand, we didn't know because this wasn't a formal announcement. This went by a network of rumors. Um, and then we suddenly had to improvise exporting material from Delicious to other places or trust in Yahoo who would variously say things that were supposed to comfort us. Um, I think a lot of CIOs, a lot of IT heads have been very nervous about Web 2.0 services. Um, and only recently have they started to uh, shift more stuff either to the cloud in general or to Google in particular. Uh, I think cloud, cloud computing architectures have become more attractive uh, for cost saving measures. Simply put, that uh, in the age of the recession, it's a great way to trim budgets, um, knowing the risk. The other is that Google and Amazon are both such titans now that it's hard to imagine a world without them. So that it's, it's different trusting, um, you know, Fred's uh, Oh, iPhone support app versus something from Google. If Fred goes away, it's no tragedy. If Google goes away, we worry about the foundations of Western civilization. So with mobile, it's again very similar. If someone has a phone and they can go to an app store or go to the web and connect with a great deal of content and bypass the central authority very quickly. Um, this is uh, a deliberate business model in some cases. Sometimes it's a happy accident or an unhappy accident if they find some of the new pieces of malware that might occur uh, or have occurred in the Android market already. So I, I think consumers are driving people, are, consumers are driving themselves towards the cloud, accelerated by mobile in many ways. And campuses, in a sense, can be the ones to be the rocks the stable places where their, their Moodle implementation won't go down. Banner will be there, and it might not be sexy or alluring or even user-friendly, but it'll still be stable. I mean, that's one way for campus to cash itself, and it's, uh, it can make all kinds of sense from policies. Um, on the other hand, they can use consumers as uh, explorers, as canaries in coal mines who get to figure out maybe, all right, here is a really good iPad printing app and let them do the exploration themselves. As a culture, we're not fully aware of this yet, but phones are great audio capture tools, video capture tools. And by great, I mean accessible and easy to use. I mean, they're not the highest quality, but they're often the good enough that the web so loves. Uh, we are right now super empowered to create our own do-it-yourself surveillance society where we can record just about anything. Um, and uh, like I said, as a culture, we haven't fully realized this yet. Uh, we don't have uh, events where people say, turn off your phones because they don't want to be recorded, um, although it's quite easy to do so right now. Um, for faculty, uh, the 
capture facility is crucial. All these mobile devices have accelerated the amount of capture and production they can do. Editing is harder, of course. Uh, and in fact, one of the charges against uh, the iPad is that's more of a consumption rather than a production tool. And it is very hard to imagine using a tool like Premiere or Final Cut on a phone. Um, but we can do some basic editing, um, and more tools are coming out every day. And then the iPhone, uh, the iOS App Store, there are many, many storytelling applications that just keep bubbling up where you can do some basic and creative editing and produce more content. But there's also the increased variety of consumption. What does it mean to read a story on the Kindle? How is this different from reading a story on a laptop? Well, there are a lot of differences. I mean, one is that it focuses your attention down. The uh, tablets do this as well, since they tend to either prohibit or make difficult multitasking. So when you're reading a story, you are immersed in that, or you're having a hard time being immersed in it, but that's your focal point right there. Anything else will have to be away from the device, the world around you, the sound of bees, whatever. If you're reading something on a laptop, then you get the whole world of the web alongside it. So if I open an EPUB document in Firefox, I'm reading about, say, I'm, I'm rereading the first book of Gulliver's Travels. I'll open a few more tabs because I want to check the name of a couple of characters. I want to check a couple of articles that I recall. And then the whole world exfoliates in different directions. It's a very, very different reading experience. Reading this on the phone, not quite the Twitter level, but definitely focusing me on a bite-sized versions. Um, all those are just, just the basic old book, the basic old printed story. Think about experiencing stories through games, how hugely different it is to play a game on a cell phone versus on Xbox and a large TV. The stories that come through those will differ immensely through the devices. And with every single category of device that we generate, we have new ways of thinking about, of being moved by, being changed by stories. And when I use the term renaissance, I mean that in a very serious way. This is a rebirth of storytelling. We've been thinking about augmented reality since the 1990s. That's where the term comes about. It's an ugly, awkward term. And one of the reasons it's awkward is because it was made as a counterbalance to the term virtual reality. Uh, so instead of creating a replica of the world in the digital environment, you take the digital environment and apply it to the physical world. Um, we've been developing augmented reality projects for a while, and they're finally beginning to take off. I, I, don't, I don't just mean the single type that people might know of pointing a phone at something and having digital content superimposed on it, that's, that's one valid time. But I mean the fact of having physical locations infested, enriched by digital content in ways that, like a, a kind of second atmosphere settling onto the Earth's surface, perhaps like a laminated layer, where you and I are talking and already we have the very, very basic but world-changing possibility that you can quickly fact-check what I just said by whipping out um, a Palm Pilot, I'm sorry, a laptop or an iPad and, and then just going through uh, Google or whatever services you'd like. Um, but also the, the fact that this is reinventing the notion of space that we inhabit. So if I can walk through the city of Providence, Rhode Island, and have a mobile device of whatever kind physically tied to certain data, an H.P. Lovecraft walking tour, uh, the great American writer, uh, was very much a creature of this city. In fact, his tombstone now reads, I am Providence. If you can walk through the town and when you stand in front of one building, pull down an image of that building in 1932, walk across the town, and as you do, note goes off and tells you right here is where a character in the shunned house is walking, that kind of thing. That is physically do this now, the technology is here, that changes the way we think about stories, it changes the way we think about spaces. We go to a campus, we're just beginning to think about what this means. If I can walk through a campus and pull that information about a building, uh, do you know the, the ITASTIS project from the European Union? So it's really, it's kind of a silly name, but if you look at uh, ITASTIS as in the Roman historian, you go in front of a European building, I think there are only about a dozen of these, and as you look at it, it pulls down historical documents from that building. So there was a, an Italian uh, villa. You could look at the design documents from the 1600s and pull them over the building, move it back and forth, and see how it actually turned out. That, we're just beginning to feel our way through this. You think about a room, Jerry. You know, we walk into this room, and the simple act of crossing it pulls down documents, changes a screen, sends a signal a different way. It's, you know, we're turning the, the entire space into a living medium in ways that 
We're just beginning to conceive. Science fiction is, is our best instructor in this way. How does this impact teaching and learning? The whole world has this second atmosphere in it now. We have to teach students how to use it effectively to learn. We have to teach teachers how to teach it effectively. How to support it is what something NERCOMP is all about. What does it mean to an 18-year-old when they remember in elementary school being able to physically participate in a tag cloud in front of their school library? They remember that. It's already old hat. What does an 18-year-old do in our campuses? How do they react to a gym or a physical classroom? Uh, what does it mean for their treatment of privacy, of, of personal space, of sex, of literacy? We're just beginning to figure this out. And, and, and since, well, there, it is good to be, to be uh, scared of some of this because we can look at, uh, at opportunities that we miss. Um, I, I was struck by an epiphany a few months ago, uh, talking to a friend of mine, that this is the best time in the history of humanity to be a learner. There's never been a time this good. If you want to study the world around you, if you want to study memory, there's never been a better time. Forget the, forget the recession, forget global warming and the onslaught of peak oil, forget all the, the horrible things that happen. Simply the, the function of learning has never had more possibility right now. For us, as educators, we have to make sure that we're still viable, that people come to us, uh, that we have a role to play. Um, if, in a sense, we have to re-justify what we do. I, I don't mean that as a, as, a, uh, as a political criticism. I mean that as simply mind share. Um, if, uh, uh, if, if, a, if a student wants to learn how to draw, deviant art might be a better teacher than their ninth grade teacher. Um, if they want to learn about the history of the Civil War, the world is rich with that. The value of the shadow is a tremendous resource. Obviously, I'm a teacher. Teachers have tremendous amounts to add, but then we have to re-explain ourselves. Why we're there, what kind of guides on the side we have to be, uh, how we help people think better. Uh, the need is there. We just have to um, make sure people understand it.